When I came here in 1961, uh, quite an irascible lady was in the biology department. She had worked for Asa Chandler, the well-known parasitologist here, for years. And she wanted some snails. And I said, I figured we would have to go somewhere. Where did we go? We went to the northeast corner of the Rice Stadium. And there's a seepage of water that comes out of the stadium above ground, and the ground is always wet there. And sure enough, as Evelyn said, and Evelyn was a 600-pound gorilla. She was never wrong. You were, Asa used to say you, uh, to graduate students, you're expendable, Evelyn isn't. So, uh, and so we picked up snails and brought them back, and the idea was that she wanted to infect them with some parasite. And we got back, and lo, about 40% of them were infected with Fasciola hepatica, which is a liver fluke of cattle, ruminants in general, gets into sheep. It also gets into rabbits as a reservoir host. But to get there initially, there had to have been some relic of eggs around, and then with the rabbit population, they become infected enough to sustain it. We haven't had any errant cows walking around on campus lately. Uh, uh, to afford, to, and I don't think, well, Asa might have done something like that. He was a wily dude, uh, but at least uh, the, uh, the fact that probably it was transmitted and carried on in the rabbit population uh, for lo these many years and maybe have stemmed from the, uh, from the cattle that were here previously. Well, what about the cover on this area? That is the vegetation. I said it was a tall grass prairie, and if you wanted to see a remnant of the tall grass prairie right now, you'd have to look far and wide. It's almost all gone. Uh, gone from the standpoint that it's been overgrazed, it's been plowed under, but it had things like golf cord grass, blue stem, both little and big, India grass, and et cetera. It was invaded by things that everyone's familiar with, the western ragweed, those with hay fever, smut grass, broom sedge, Yankee weed, and everything. So remnants of this you can see along the railroad right of ways to the west of town along 90, old Highway 90. You see some of it. It also had the normal things that we enjoy this time of year, the forbs of asters, the paintbrushes, the blue bonnets, and even the evening primrose. Unless you went out, as my wife and I did last weekend, weekend before this. And then I read in the paper Monday, you're, it'll be two weeks before they'll be out. I can verify that. Uh, the wildflowers were not out, and they will be coming out. Oaks, are they any different than the ones we have? We have our solitary post oak on campus. Live oaks were common. Uh, we satch. And then an imported species that is sort of Interesting, we don't know exactly where it came from. We, we know where it came from, we don't know how it got here. And that's McCartney's Rose. And throughout the history of uh, vegetation and, and the depiction of Rice campus, they talk about the clumps of roses on the western part of the, of the campus. In the sea of grass that they had, it was probably well grazed, but uh, there were these roses. When they came to Texas, I'm not sure, but they're everywhere now. It's sort of like kudzu and honeysuckle, if you bear with me. What about animals? I said that there, this area was pr pretty deperate in large ungulates, deer, bison, but it certainly had a component. The coyotes weren't here yet then. They came much later. The river otters were here. Mr. Glow, Joe Legold, graduated in 33, uh, told me of many experiences with river otters in Harris Gully. Uh, rabbits. Uh, the armadillo, it wasn't here then. And what is the armadillo? It's our state mammal. It didn't come to this state until the late 1800s. And it migrated slowly, but it wasn't at Rice at that particular time, by record. Pardon. So it's a, we've seen change. We've seen change. What about birds? In my experience, on this campus. The western part of the campus, this is since the construction of the stadium, 
with a large parking lot, Canadian geese, white fronted geese, roseate spoonbills, white faced glossy ibis, coots, three or four species of ducks. And they always occur on an overcast night, foggy night, following a rain, when the reflected light off the clouds, it, the parking lot looks like a body of water, or, and part of the campus may be underwater too. Waterfowl is not that sparse on this campus. Ever so many times at commencement, you'll see a pair of fulvous whistling ducks from a zoo make a circle in a quadrangle and go back and everyone looks at me and says, where's your duck call uh, when that happens? But we're close enough to the zoo to have a large attraction of animals. To wit, the night herons which roost over the president's swimming pool along the pine trees on South Boulevard. Uh, we have a large number of resident and breeding birds that are here primarily because of the attraction of the parking lot. That's over also. The affluence of the student body and the number of cars, there's no more attraction of birds of that nature to the parking lot. There's too many cars out there. Another change. So I think this lecture can boil down to something in terms of space and time. How those fat parameters fit into it and what's happened to Rice over this period of time. Well, about this time also, Julian Huxley arrived as the first member of the biology department. And with him came Joe Davies, who anyone that's ever been associated with Davies since 1967, his untimely death at that time, was certainly no. Uh, shortly after that, Herman Mueller came, then Edgar Altenberg, and both of those two gentlemen share something in the history of Rice in a biological sense, the ecology, the scientific ecology of, of uh, Rice, and the fact that they both worked on the same experimental organism, Drosophila. They both worked on the effect of ionizing radiation in creating mutants. Mueller stayed two years and left and ended up finally at Indiana University, went to Texas and then on to Indiana. He received the Nobel Prize. He used one type of radiation. Dr. Altenberg used the other. Their papers were published almost head to tail in genetics and Dr. Altenberg didn't receive the uh, uh, Nobel Prize. It was not shared at that time. I always remember Altenberg. I, I'm full of digressions. Uh, you would, uh, uh, when President Pitzer was the inauguration of President Pitzer, everyone was flowing across the campus and Dr. Altenberg came out of his office with his cap and gown on and there was cardboard showing through the mortar board Half of the tassel was chewed off. And as he walked in the sunlight like this, it looked like a fishnet. Uh, his, his cap and gown was moth-eaten to say the best. But it was a beautiful piece of, of history of rice to see him. The only other person I can think of that was in the Jasper Rose in the art department who had an equally sorry looking academic regalia at that. I told you, I've been here half a life, Rice, and, uh, and I do follow uh, Yogi's admonition and make a few observations occasionally. Well, in 1916, Huxley left, and as the story goes, and if anyone knew that little Welshman with the teeth that didn't quite fit in his mouth, and he would snort and seat those and then proceed to lecture, Joe Davies decided the Queen could win the war and he would stay, and so he stayed went through his degrees and became full professor, chairman of the department several times. And then, as I say, he retired just a few days before his retirement in 1967. Observations. Uh, I always also like to think about what my connections to Rice are and have been. And they go back quite a, quite a distance. Hanover, College, Pat and I entered there in 1949, and I had the distinction of meeting a fellow by the name of J. Dan Webster. And I guess I've bumped into a lot of strict people, but J. Dan was really strict. He came from Jamestown. He was a father of a Presbyterian minister, 
And he came to Hanover, and uh, he threw everything into a tizzy. And I remember one time he, he taught introductory biology, he taught uh, physiology, he taught microbiology, and he taught ornithology, bird courses. Well, they had two courses, baby birds and big birds. That is, if you did well in baby birds, you could take big birds. It had nothing to do with the size of the birds. And he gave practicals. He would lay out birds on the table. And you'd get your little piece of paper and you'd go along and he'd give you a minute to identify the bird. He'd snap his fingers or ring a bell and you'd move to the next one. So it was a daisy chain, everyone walking around. The fellow in the course when I was taking it, we went in to take the practical and there was nothing but a bunch of brown bags. And the only thing you could see were the feet sticking out. Genus and species. Second question, habitat, genus and species. The fellow who was taking a course, he was getting a little bit upset. At the time, when he finally finished the 25 or 30 questions, whatever it was, he stormed up and he told Dr. Webster, Jane Adams, we referred to him, he said, you're the sorriest professor I've ever seen and didn't clean up his explicatives too well. And Jane Adams says, what's your name? And he pulled his leg up like this and he says, you figure it out. <laughs> so that, I didn't do that. <laughs> I wish I had. Uh, uh, <laughs> a foggy night and birds and Jay Dan, a, a beautiful thing. What about other birds on the campus? How many people remember the great influx, the pH of the atmosphere due to the decomposition of uric acid into ammonia was about pH 9. You take a piece of litmus paper and hold it up under the trees out here and it turned blue immediately. Space and time, now let's think about this. Dan Johnson, who was an ecologist in the department at that time, and Heidi Good, a graduate student, worked on this. And they had estimates of some, like a two and a quarter million blackbirds roosting here. Roosting. Now, during that phase of their life, they are gregarious. Two and a half million is gregarious. So in the daytime, they would fly west to the prairies and the abandoned rice fields, and they'd feed. A night they would come back into the campus. And this went on, and Carl McDowell, it's been mentioned several times here, he was at his wit's end. He did everything outside of firing guns. He had carbide cannons, as they're called. They're a propane-powered cannon that when the pressure builds up, a striker, it evacuates it, and the release of propane, it explodes. They hung snakes in the trees. They did everything, and finally the birds left. But they went across Rice Boulevard to the Shady Acres, is that right? And that didn't create any goodwill of two and a half million birds going from 300 acres over to just a few acres over there. But the question is, why did they finally leave? Now, the people on campus said, we finally found a trick. We shaved off all of the understory of the oak trees and just left a canopy, the outer veneer of leaves, and got rid of all that brushy stuff under it. And that's true in part. But since I gave a talk to the uh, Rice Women's, Faculty Women's Club, I think it was, I had a chance to reflect on this a little bit. And several things happened. Trees of Houston came along and several other organizations, and what did they do? They started planting trees in the strip between the city property, between the sidewalk and the curb, every place. Now bear in mind at this time, Sharpstown and Greenway Plaza were a bit under development. Trees were planted there. Well, the young live oak trees, you don't start pruning those until they're maybe 20 or 30 feet tall, but these little bushy trees coming up afforded a beautiful opportunity. If you don't believe this is true, go to Sharpstown now 
and drive along any place along Greenway Plaza, all of those unshorn trees are full of the birds that would normally be here. We did do an aversion technique, whether it worked, and subsequently these other trees grew up. What happened also is a fact that the city of Houston proceeded westerly. The distance of flight was much greater. Birds not being stupid, they're out there foraging and trying to get energy. If they can cut to half the distance they have to fly to find a place to roost, they're going to do so. As long as it's lighted and there's folks around and there's fewer things that like to pluck them out of the trees and eat them. And that's why they like to come to trees. So the distance got greater and they've so gradually moved into the western part of the city and we no longer have the problem. You might ask a question of how a biologist works, how his mind works. And it's kinky to say the least. But I said there are two and a half million birds here. How do we know? Well, you can, you can make some assumptions. And you can put a few birds in a cage, and you put 10 of them in, and you count how many poops they have a night. And now you know a rate of how many times they poop at night. Well, then you can go out, and the reason this is done, they take the pie plates, which are cheap, paper pie plates, and put them on a stake with a thing, and put them, scatter them all over the tree, uh, under the trees, and then you count poop pops on these. From this, you can create a line of high-density birds, low-density birds, and eventually come up with a population estimate. And those are called isopoops. Those lines of, uh, the, the engineers will love this, but uh, they, <laughs> it's, it's birds per concentration of that. So that's the way biologists work. Uh, uh, well, let's ask another question that's happened. One of the most successful animals on the campus now in this changing environment are squirrels. And how many kinds of squirrels do we have on this campus? It's interesting. On the campus, there's one species, the eastern fox squirrel. You cross Rice Boulevard and go into Southampton, and immediately things change. They're mostly the eastern gray squirrel. Now, why is that? And that gives us some idea of indicators that you can look at a situation and say, what sort of terrain, what sort of vegetation do you have, and put a story together. Fox squirrels, the ones on the campus, spend an inordinate amount of time running around on the ground. They forage on the ground, they forage on mushrooms, toadstools, nuts, seeds, tacos, tostitos, candy, everything that's provided for them, but they spend more time on the ground. The gray squirrel is mostly arboreal stays most of the time in the trees. The trees here are pretty sparse, and the squirrels seldom, uh, the gray squirrels, there's not a great deal of competition between them, and it's strictly a habitat-driven phenomenon. The other thing is that the squirrels have taken up some unusual behaviors, is that they like to re roost, or roost, breed, and nest in your attic. And those houses over there that were built 70 years ago have got a lot of holes in them, and there's a lot of addicts, and the red squirrel is less inclined to do that. 